Uh, good evening uh, again, everybody, to our weekly cerebrovascular and skull based symposium. This is uh, from the University of Miami, and this is session number 23 in that Thursday series. Uh, Jacques, I'm Jacques Morcos, professor and co chair of the department, uh, director of cerebrovascular and skull based surgery. As always, as every week, it's my intense pleasure to have the co directors of this course. Carolina Benjamin, uh, assistant professor, director of our Keynes Dissection Lab, specializes in brain tumors and skull based surgery. Mike Ivan, uh, director of UM Brain Tumor Initiative, specializes in brain tumors, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as my two endovascular, open vascular colleagues, uh, Bobby Stark and Eric Peterson. It's been a great series so far, going back to May, since we started with the, with the COVID days. Uh, you, this is our lovely place in Miami with the two main hospitals, University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital, and that's what uh, constitutes our center. So for the audience members, please, uh, I know you will have questions to our distinguished four speakers today. Jot them down in the Q&A box, and we will address them uh, at the end. We don't offer CMEs. I will give my speakers a two minute warning before the end of their talks to make sure we have enough time for questions. And again, please share our information on your social media. Uh, uh, we have finished setting up the coming sessions into December 17. And if you go to our website, you can see them in detail. Uh, but this is where we are, session 23 today, and several other sessions have been confirmed. Please note, we will give everybody a rest on Thanksgiving uh, holiday on November 26. Uh, next week, we have a fantastic panel on uh, uh, wide neck aneurysms with Felipe Albuquerque and Sander Connolly discussing endovascular and open surgical options with three fantastic panelists, Judy Huang, Babak Jahromi, and Adel Malik. Uh, if you're interested in cerebrovascular, please join us. As well as the Wednesday series that Mike Ivan, my partner, has started back in April on Global Brain Tumor Symposium. And again, Mike has uh, invited uh, the fantastic Gallery Zadi, actually the new chair in Toronto, and she will talk about methylation signatures and introducing a paradigm change in neurosurgery. So please join us for also that very successful Wednesday series. Uh, those of you uh, interested in joining yet another webinar tonight before the presidential debate, uh, which will be at 9 p.m., uh, I'm actually giving one with Peter Kahn on cerebrovascular and endovascular neurosurgery to the young neurosurgical uh, committee uh, organized by Jeremiah Johnson. And this is the link at 7.15 p.m. tonight, essentially right after this one. And I'll put it in the chat box later if you're interested to join us. Many thanks to the team that makes this series of webinar uh, happen, uh, particularly Ignacio there at the bottom right who is running this. These are the ways you can connect with us at the University of Miami, in our department. Uh, you can review and view all previously recorded sessions. If you've missed them, feel free to contact me directly or our training program. Uh, Ingrid Menendez, our uh, director of education or the departmental Instagram or Twitter. On to tonight. Uh, it's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce briefly our four speakers. We will not have panelists for this session. We'll just have four speakers who will each speak 25 minutes on a variation on intraoperative visualization, augmented reality, virtual reality, fluorescence, and so forth. So first, I'll start with uh, Walter, Walter Jean, who's professor of neurosurgery, director of skull based surgery at George Washington University. And you will notice with each one of those speakers, I'm going to say what I have in common with them. So what I have in common with Walter is we both are, have the same alma mater, University of Minnesota, 
we barely overlap together since I'm significantly older than him. Uh, and we did our residency there. He did his fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. His early career was at uh, Georgetown University, then moved to GW. Walter is a spectacular skull-based surgeon who has particular interest, among others, in globalization of skull-based training. And he loves soccer, singing, and Italian wine. I invite you to also uh, uh, look into purchasing that great book that he has published recently on strategies in skull-based surgery. Uh, next is Akio Morita, professor and chair of neurosurgery and dean of graduate medical education, uh, Nippon Medical School. Of course, he's with us live from Japan. It's 6 a.m. on his time, and I thank him for joining us. Uh, he did his uh, residency uh, at University of Tokyo, and I think Akio is one of the most overtrained people, perhaps. Look how many fellowships with how many people he's done in the US uh, before really starting his career. I cannot list Akio's accomplishments. I've just chose to highlight one of his major contributions, and that's a natural history of aneurysms in the UCA studies. Those are phenomenal studies that showed us so, uh, so much, but Akio has a, um, a, sp a spectacular practice in skull base and vascular neurosurgery. Now, what we have in common, he and I, we work, uh, we're very active at WFNS, he's secretary and I'm committee chair of bylaws and we interact, we've known each other quite a bit, particularly through that. Uh, Josh Patterson, professor of neurosurgery and system chair at Mount Sinai Health System, residency UCSF fellowships in Zurich, in Ljubljana, of course, with Vinko Dolenk, and Lastly, at the BNI, which is where we interact. I'm a BNI former fellow with Spetzler as well. Uh, I again, Josh is somebody I cannot list his accomplishments in this little slide, but what he has done since he's been chair over the last 12 years at Mount Sinai is phenomenal. He started his career early there with models for strokes, subarachnoid hemorrhage, his collaboration in skull base with ENT at Mount Sinai, taken it and expanding that system has been remarkable, in addition, of course, to his interest with the, the theme he's going to talk about tonight. And he needs to be congratulated for uh, having the prestigious Jacobi medallion that Mount Sinai offers their distinguished uh, faculty just this year. So congrats, Josh. Last but not least, uh, Bernard Bendo, professor and chair at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale, uh, uh, Bernard and I have several things in common, but we are both from Lebanon originally. So Bernard did his residency at Northwestern University, fellowship at Sunny in endovascular. Bernard has a spectacular practice in both cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's been very appreciative of the mentorship he's had from multiple people, but particularly Han Bajer. And Bernard is doing tremendous work at, uh, at Mayo Clinic, particularly in innovation and simulation center and education, and in addition to his busy uh, running of the department and his busy clinical practice. I'm going to, uh, again, I remind you, those of you, if you wanted the link to join us after this webinar uh, to the next one. But uh, for the lineup for tonight, Josh will go first because he has to leave us by 6 p.m. So. If you, the audience, have questions for Josh, please write them early so we can ask them to him before he leaves. Akio will go second because he has to leave at 6.30 p.m., then Walter, then Bernard. So, Josh, without further ado, please, uh, I invite you to share your slides and proceed. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jacques. It reminds us of why neurosurgery is so much fun and what a privilege it is to do neurosurgery, just to be participating in something like this with such illustrious friends and partners. Uh, you know, I'm, I pinch myself every day that I get to work with people like you. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about micro navigation, AR and heads up display in ABM and skull based surgery. And uh, I'm being, I'm being, uh, I'm setting my timer to make sure that we do not go over. 
uh, here are some disclosures, financial disclosures that I have. I'm sure I don't need to remind people here the differences between VR and AR with VR um, separate from the real world and augmented reality overlaid on the real world. I think the best examples would be the use of a heads up display in aviation to demonstrate the differences um, between these two. Uh, in my estimation, um, simulation is good for planning and that can be done during surgery, not necessarily before surgery, but simulation is what we use to plan. Navigation gets you there and AR and heads up display helps me do it better. Of course, there are many uses and applications of microscope integration and, micro and mixed reality. Uh, and we'll just focus mainly on the intraoperative aspects of these. We can't go over all of these, obviously. Uh, the workflow for AR, VR, and heads up display in neurosurgery is to first create a simulation to link that simulation to the patient's anatomy, and then to abstract some of that information and inject it into the surgeon's point of view. In practical terms, uh, there's preparation, planning, and practice. Uh, preparation involving getting the scans, defining the regions of interest, and segmenting and painting the critical structures to select the relevant objects and define your approach, to link those objects that you've defined to the microscope, endoscope, or exoscope, and then to take some of that information and to inject it into the surgeon's point of view, um, as well as the ability to re-register, to update, to correct for errors that you encounter during this process. Uh, the surgeon's cockpit is familiar to everyone, um, and the concept of microscope integration requires that you link the microscope's X, Y position to the navigation and the simulation. Uh, of course, X, Y data is not everything, and we need to also link the Z axis. And here you see, as we advance the focus point deep uh, on the top right, you see the injected information navigating and updating. So that really we're tracking the surgeon's eyes, if you will, in the X, Y, and Z planes. Uh, some people still remain somewhat uh, sketchy or confused on the difference between heads up display, picture in picture, and a screen injection. So here we see navigated uh, uh, and simulated information that is injected into a screen. Um, we've got the microscope integrated. And so here in, in my hand, I'm holding the probe, which is represented here by the green line. And the microscope is also being tracked, which is represented by the blue line. They're both focused on the same place. And so you see the two navigated points focused on the patient's scalp over here. As we approach the microscope, we see that this information is abstracted and injected into the eyepiece, as you see here. And so this is heads up display, navigated and tracked uh, to the eyepieces. We differentiate this from picture in picture, which can also be injected into the eyepieces, but that's quite different than heads up display. Heads up display is the, these dotted and solid lines and the picture in picture you see over here. I'm doing about two to three cases of heads up display each week. Now the number has increased to about, I would say three, three per week uh, in which I'm using the technology as part of my regular workflow. Uh, I use it for just routine skull based cases and I use it for occasional AVM uh, patients at this point, I've used it for 30 AVM patients. This would be a typical application, uh, a CP angle tumor. And uh, it's often used by the resident to fix the angle. Here you see the 
tumor overlaid on the superior sagittal sinus in a retrosigmoid approach. And the resident then sees what their initial angle would have been. And then if they angle the microscope back, they see, well, that's a little bit better. And then during surgery, just the overlay of the transverse sigmoid junction on the retrosigmoid approach, the outline of the tumor injected into the eyepieces and uh, standard, this is now standard workflow, heads up display and in image injection. How do we go beyond standard navigation? Uh, and we can focus on intraoperative re-registration, micro-navigation to mission critical cranial nerves or blood vessels, as well as applications in AVM surgery. This is an example of intraoperative navigation update, a small tuberculum cell meninge. In this case, we choose the transbrow approach, although transnasal would have been just fine. Um, and this is the, the, the initial view, the transbrow approach. And you, you're, you're looking ahead to what you anticipate finding once we get deep. But what happens once we get deep? Well, here is the optical information demonstrating the location of the right optic and olfactory nerves. And here's where the navigation is off. We're off by almost, I wanna say, um, oh, about a centimeter or so. So there's been shift of the structures. The optic nerve is way off to the right compared to where it should be. And so we need to then go into navigation update mode. And then uh, the assistant will drag the injected image to better overlay what we see during surgery. At first, uh, she overshoots it a little bit. And so then we go back a little bit and eventually decide that we're satisfied with the new overlay. Uh, we can then confirm with our probe. And now we have re-registered the patient and we can continue on with the surgery. And so now, Whereas before this optic nerve was way over to the right, we've kind of overlapped it. And that means that we're a little more secure of where the tumor margin is anticipated to be later on. So this, this is a, an advance in the use of navigation and heads up display. Navigating to mission critical nerves and structures, so-called micronavigation can also be useful. I like to show this case just because of who the patient is, but um, frequently with heads up display, if you do not select the information that is abstracted and injected into the screen, there'll really be way too much information uh, to make it useful. And so I find it useful to simplify what is injected. And in this case, all I'm really interested in are the tumor margins outlined in blue the location of the vertebral basilar junction and the location of the seventh nerve in this cord plexus papilloma. Um, and so knowing where the margin is can be helpful. Uh, knowing where the basilar is deep can be helpful, but definitely knowing where the seventh nerve is gonna be is also helpful. And here you see the view of the machine about a millimeter off and confirming the location uh, with the uh, electro here and the seventh nerve uh, function is confirmed and uh, taking a little bit of heat off of me that her seventh nerve functions at the end of the case. This is a patient in which I thought switching back and forth between heads up display navigation and intraoperative simulation was useful. And I'll try to demonstrate that. Um, in this case, a uh, you know, woman who's had surgery before for trauma and has a, um, has a prosthesis here. Of course, you've got the standard concerns. Um, and I'll just stop this here for a second. In fact, I'm going to go back just a little bit because uh, I think the important parts of this case are the location of the ICA bifurcation. Um, and importantly, so here's the clinoid, the ICA, the PCOM, going back to PCA. 
if we're going to go through the tumor, through Kawasi's triangle, and down into her posterior fossa to decompress the brainstem, we want to know where the carotid, the intertumoral carotid is, which we see here through the tumor. I think that's a very important part of this case. Uh, and so I'll see if I can demonstrate how the use of the technology makes that a little bit easier. Uh, in the initial approach, we see the tumor uh, and confirm our location. Uh, once we've done the navigation update, we see a very good overlap. The pink is the carotid artery confirmed with the vascular probe. Um, and then comes the part that I think is more interesting. So using the navigation probe here, we know that the internal carotid artery is located uh, inside. And we can track the navigation probe with surgical theater. We cannot track the heads up display uh, using brain lab. We can only do that with uh, Medtronic. But I think that This demonstrates the probe in the simulated case, the internal carotid artery running into the tumor and through the tumor as we pass by uh, over the petrous apex and towards the brainstem. So this is the view of the simulation, this here, and this is the view during surgery. We don't see the carotid, but we know that we're right near it, and then that helps us to proceed and complete a subtotal resection safely. Of course, the AR, VR, and heads-up display can be injected into the microscope. We also use it when we're using an exoscope or an endoscope. I don't really use the exoscope that frequently, um, but this is what it looks like when I do use it. Uh, this is synaptive. Uh, I know a number of you like to use this. Uh, many people feel that the resolution is better. Uh, I'm just, I'm used to the microscope. And even though the beautiful image we get with the exoscope may have very, very high resolution, I find that the in and out and the, the, the rapidity with which I can move myself around with the microscope continues to provide me with an advantage over the ex exoscope. Although, of course, the digital information can be overlaid on the exoscope and the endoscope. And with the endoscope, it's used routinely in our transnasal work. One of the issues that people ask sometimes is who does all the work to make this flow properly? Uh, clearly, our industry partners, our clinical partners, my excellent team of PAs and others, uh, many of you know Leslie Schlachter, uh, who's deeply involved in this, neuroradiology. And in the vascular realm, uh, people like Alex Berenstein, Rene Chapeau, when we are really trying to do complex AVMs and apply this technology in these cases. So how do we apply the technology in AVM surgery? Well, here's a fairly straightforward AVM, although the preoperative embolization was limited by the multiple turns here. And so the idea for the heads-up display was that we wanted to navigate to a very specific place. Since they were not able to embolize safely, uh, my idea was that we wanted to pick this point that I'm pointing out right here and isolate this segment of artery for navigation, inject this one piece of information into the heads-up display and so-called micro-navigate to this one spot. And that is what uh, I hope this shows. So we've got the heads up display and I've got this segment of artery in pink here outlined. And as, as we progress down the inner hemispheric fissure and through the AVM, this branch of the artery comes into view and we'll follow it distally all the way to this one branch point, which you'll see right here. So I like this picture because it shows the concept of abstracting only the critical information and injecting it into the heads-up display. So of all of the data that we have on this AVM, we've taken just this one curve, attached this to the navigation, and injected it into the heads-up display. This is what I think of as micro-navigation. Um, here's a 
slightly more complicated case. And in this case, what we want to do is sequentially identify our targets, our arterial targets, and I've labeled them one, two, and three. We're going to micro-navigate to the arterial targets um, and do those in sequence. Uh, again, a concept of micro-navigation. Here's a more complicated case, a 58-year-old with multiple prior embolizations, radio surgeries, uh, who presents with progressive uh, symptoms. And here we're going to use anatomy and geographic anatomy to differentiate draining veins, nidus, and feeding arteries. Um, I'm not gonna show this part of the simulation here, but I think this, this image in the bottom center shows how we've di differentiated nidus, draining vein, and arteries. We're gonna target fly two zones of the feeding arteries. We're gonna use the outline of the nidus as we've defined it to come around the nidus and the no-fly zones are going to be the draining veins as they empty into the superior sagittal sinus. This is one where Alex and Renee were in the operating room with me. That was very fortunate. Um, and so here you see the overlay of, on the top left, you see the draining vein in blue. You see our, you may or may not see the purple of the nidus. And then we're navigating to these very specific arterial inflow sites during the surgery. And I'll sort of just pass through the ABM, uh, through the video here, uh, showing how we use this during the case. You know, this case points out that for AVM navigation, we're limited to fixed anatomy. Uh, we have one point in time. Uh, AVMs obviously are time dependent lesions. And so what about the concept of adding the element of time, so-called four-dimensional VR, uh, which I think is a new horizon in VR, AR, and HUD, and I'll, I'll finish with this case. So it's the same case now that I just showed, uh, only we're now trying to apply new technology to it. Uh, as you know, we can get DICOM images now uh, from the spin of a, a digital angiogram, DSA, and create uh, a navigable uh, set of angiograms. But what we've not done until now is done this in a time-dependent manner so that we can spin the AVM and navigate through time, at, both on the same thing. One of the problems here is that there's a lot of data. And in this particular data set, 76,000 slices. Uh, and so here you see what I think is the first time this has been done, uh, it's certainly in my area, a navigable 3D time resolve image uh, so that we can stop and freeze this image, navigate at any particular point and differentiate feeding arteries and draining veins, as well as uh, get to the early phase arterial, late phase arterial, and the venous phase. Uh, one thing I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'm actually finished now. I wanted to just touch on one other application of advanced digital technology that relates to what Jock was talking about before. Uh, many times now people are less happy about coming for a routine visit. And if we can connect with patients preoperatively, whether they are local or remote, uh, they seem to appreciate this. Uh, this is an example of a, a recent case. Uh, I'm not going to let you listen to all of this, but what this shows is that a young lady with a small cavernous malformation living about two hours away, um, everything about her preoperative workup, her referral, the consultation with her and her mom, uh, all of the preoperative discussion occurred over Zoom. And I met her for the very first time, literally four minutes before she was wheeled into the operating room. Uh, both she and her family were extremely comfortable with this scenario. 
Uh, we did see her for one post-op visit. So I met her four minutes before surgery. She stayed in the hospital a day or so. She, and she did come back for one post-operative visit. It's not strictly speaking AR, VR and, and micro navigation, but I do think it's an interesting extension of how technology has, uh, has helped us. So some parting thoughts. Um, my view is that micro navigation intraoperative uh, navigation update, and more importantly, heads up display does allow us to prepare effectively and in some cases to execute more effectively. Um, I do like the concept of mapping out no fly zones and to target my sequence uh, with micro navigation. And I am convinced that telehealth is going to be, is, has changed the way we do things, not only like we were doing tonight on this excellent symposium that Jacques has organized, uh, but also the way we're interacting with patients. So uh, with that, I will stop and I thank you for this invitation and for the opportunity, Jacques. Thanks so much, Josh. This was very, very nice and I'm sure very well received by, by the audience. Uh, before I, I ask you a quick question, maybe uh, uh, I, there are no audience questions. Any of the co-speakers would like to ask Josh something before he leaves us later? Any, any challenges, uh, any questions? Bernard, go ahead. Uh, really, Josh, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, You're not on video, Bernard, unless you oh, 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 sorry, sorry, here we go. Um, uh, I didn't... Uh, Quick question, Josh, you alluded to the issue of support for all this. And I see that as being one of the biggest challenges as the technology. I'm always surprised at how many more people we have in the OR than we did 10 years ago. So there, there was a, the fallacy that more technology means less jobs. I, I see it as just the opposite in our field. So where, where do you see it going in terms of, uh, do you see local investments in this technology or do you, do you see it more as it's gonna be an online support perhaps? Where do you see the future of this? There's only so much we can afford in terms of the number of people we have in the OR to support this amazing technology. And where, do, where should we go with this? A great question, Bernard. I think it's a hybrid of all of what you said. Uh, certainly industry, if they expect to be in our ORs, need to be in our ORs and they need to support this robustly with on-site uh, support. You know, I find myself migrating towards companies who are willing to provide that support. They don't provide the clinical support, although the more they support our efforts, the more sophisticated they get. Uh, and so I have seen that as the technicians have spent some time with us, uh, they become quite sophisticated, even to the point of being able to explain things to patients and families from time to time. But the hospitals invested major bucks in the technology. And so they're also now investing in a full-time person whose job it is to learn as much as they can about these things and to provide ongoing support. And finally, for things like this four-dimensional time resolve uh, work and highly sophisticated work, this is done, being done remotely through collaborations uh, both with scientists and with industry on, on a remote basis. I am concerned about the number of people due to infection risk and other things. I think there are too many people. Uh, and so we do have to limit it as well as the cost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Josh, uh, for people who have not used the technology before, is there a danger of being overwhelmed by too much data being infused in the microscope or, or not? Or what's, uh, what, what's your thoughts? On Absolutely. That? Absolutely. I, I tried to show one of the one of the slides where there's just TMI, and uh, it's overwhelming. You have to, and that's why I keep coming back to this concept of focusing on very specific targets that you think are important to you, and abstracting the, all this information into what is relevant. And the other question is, when is the best when is the best time to learn this in a career? Uh, is it when you are your mind is young and agile and you are still you are still learning, uh, or is it when you're older and you already know how to fly the plane? Right. I'm not really sure what the answer to this is. Um, probably someone like Walter, who may be right in the sweet spot, <laughs> uh, 
is at the exactly the right moment of, of his career to be doing this. Well, we're going to hear him later on, see what his thoughts are. Josh, great. Any, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to let Josh go and ask Akio. Oh, well, Akio, you have a question? No. Okay. I'm just uh, saying goodbye. Oh, you're waving. <laughs> okay. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. Very appreciative for this excellent presentation. And of course, it's all recorded and people can look at everything later. Take care. Bye, Thank Josh. You. Akio, go ahead and load your slides. Okay. So you're going to talk to us about the usefulness of 4K video microscopy. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Jack, uh, for inviting me for this. And good afternoon, everybody. For the, but good good morning for Asian people now. If you are listening, I'm talking about uh, 4K video microscope and which our experience with brain tumors and other other uh, disease. I have no conflict in interest uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, for the basic compress, uh, concept for brain tumor surgery, we need to do is a maximum resection, and at the same time, we need to preserve and improve function. Gimmicks to do that is uh, we want to remove tumor as you steer from the brain, so you need, you should do you should uh, provide the only minimal refraction of surrounding tissue and no damage to around. And uh, return surround tissue to original position is a basic concept. So slow, meticulous dissection. You can, maybe if you can take five years or seven years to dissect, it might be safe, but we cannot take that time. So we need to concentrate in one hour or so to remove the tumor by slow and the meticulous dissection to return the, all the positions coming back. And also develop, uh, even when you develop in tumor, you should not you should not stretch that surrounding tissue. You should loosen all the surrounding tissue. So you should go to central. And the respect lacanoid is very important. I show one case. This is a cystic acoustic, uh, and the cystic acoustic uh, sometimes it's uh, very dangerous because the uh, facial nerve is sometimes in a, a very unexpected part. This is a very membranous facial nerve now. After removing tumor slowly, this gets uh, um, like a bundle now. So, but uh, when you see first, this is just a membrane. And I wrote a book as a, like a lower for tumor resection technique because you need lots of technique. You can approach it, but to remove the tumor, you need to have lots of uh, tactics and gimmicks, uh, such as this dissection plane, you should choose the light plane for the lacanoid. Well, how that the CSF flow, you need to know how the CSF is flowing. Like these trees, you can see when you dissect from this backside, you are facing all the branches. But if you go from the bottom, you can easily dissect it. And also that when you're removing tumor, you should smaller, you should make it very small. Because otherwise, you are pushing too hard on the left side, then your light hand is not meticulous as you wanted. And also for developing the lots of technique, you should go centralize all that the tumors. You can divide it in half and, and along that all the important tissue and divide it with bipolar or you can reduce it as like this or QSER. For imaging, how important is uh, you need to identify plane, especially arachnoid, and also maybe you should be able to see the CSF flow, how the CSF is going in. And also differentiate tumor from normal tissue is very important. And also you need to find the breathing spot and how the breathing is occurring. It's from a vessel or from the sinus or some mid, you know, sinus-like tissue in, among the brain tumor. You need to know that and also uh, you, you want to link to the navigation system like uh, Joshua showed. And uh, you should co-utilize with other visual equipment such as endoscope or uh, ultrasound and others. I introduce an uh, OBI system, which is uh, Olympus companies providing now. Uh, it's a video, it's uh, involved in the 4K camera and the 555-inch 4K 3D monitor for operators and the 33 inch assistant monitor is also 4K and also 3D. 
and the focus range is 250 to 550, and zoom is one to 12 times. So, and also there's a digital zoom. And because it's a one time zoom, you can use this as a you know, usual on the macroscopic surgery too. So the translation from macroscopic to microscope is very easy. And the OVA is very lightweight and easy manipulation. It's not like a, a other system. And the wide, there's a wide surgical space in front of a chest or a body. And so it's very free. And uh, high quality vision and the various mo modality of image, including 5A narrow band image and the ICG. And uh, we published uh, this uh, initial experience in uh, operative neurosurgery and, uh, two years ago or so. And uh, um, this is the uh, introductory this video, video uh, for that. To report uh, the experience video. of Orbi, a new surgical instrument. The whole picture of Orbi was compared with the microscope used in our hospital. The left side is the body of Orbi and a 55-inch monitor. The body part is clearly smaller. The scope unit is a hand grip. The scope unit incorporates switches that allow to freely select functions, such as magnification, fluorescence, <coughs> and lighting brightness. Differences compared with the microscope is that there are no eyepieces, so there is no camera in front of the face. Therefore, the surgeon can see the hand. The hand grip can freely fix the direction and height. This is the operating room during a right lateral suboccipital approach, and the surgeon is positioned on the patient's backside. Superficial temporal artery to middle cerebral artery anastomosis of moya moya disease is shown. From the skin incision to the SDA MCA anastomosis, the operation was performed continuously using Orbi. No cyan in green video angiography image is shown. The left image is taken with Orbi and you can white see one that the, with uh, a middle meninger are seeing this uh, Orbi, but not by a uh, blood vessels Santero. in the brain surface are depicted in more detail yes. in the 4K Orbi image. In this case, a left temporal GBM was clearly fluorescent in 5 ALA. It is like a real charcoal inside the brain. Also, or we can I see the all the other normal tissue. Another surgical this. microscope on the right side. So you can walk on doing this with uh, uh, 5 ALA version. It's very hard to work on with Pentero with 5 a A digital image processing system is incorporated. The stronger the edge effect, the clearer the boundary of the blood vessel. In addition, 4K high resolution image allows you to see red blood cell granules in the bleeding part. Now you can see the CSF roll. The image of this machine tended to have a strong red color as a whole. The characteristic of Orbi is that the visual axis of the camera and the operator are not three-dimensionally identical. This video was created to report the experience of Orbi. Well, the position wise, uh, what the problem is uh, assistant, because assistant want to see uh, that uh, angled view, but it's very hard to make angled view for 3D. And uh, uh, lateral position and the spine position. It's like uh, sometimes, you know, assistant walk just the side of that, uh, of the up operators. We have uh, initially for this paper, we initially we experienced 20, and now it's up, up to about 60 cases now. Uh, what 
we cannot, I cannot, I couldn't finish, and uh, we cannot finish with uh, uh, vestibular schwannoma because uh, for me, microscope is better for the nature to, uh, you know, comparing with the plain capsule and the nerve and other tissues. And also pituitary adenoma and the intercerebral hemorrhage plus nasal or small hole surgery, it will be very hard to achieve with this system. But uh, it's very easy to do that, it's, uh, such as microvascular decompression, not the dime surgery, but we do with uh, maybe quarter size craniotomy is enough, you know, there's enough lightning and it's, it's easy to do that with this system. I'll show some specific image one by one as it's already shown. For the glioblastoma, this is meningioma case in the bottom. Uh, it's very kind of surprising. Like for real charcoal, this is half and this is the real 5 way ala image. Here, as you can see, you can see the, all the brains and tissues. And, and uh, at the same time, you can see very bright 5 way ray colors. It's not approved in the United States, I believe. And this is a narrow band image I'll show later. And uh, which is show that the clearly abnormal brain tissue and abnormal tissues. And this is a, a, a regular view. And uh, then this is a 5A review. And then clearly you can see, start seeing this tumor like a real charcoal inside brain. Then you can remove all uh, you know, 5A positive uh, tissues like this. And this is a narrowband image. This is developed for uh, end organ, you know, uh, uh, cancer surgery, like uh, esophageal or what others. It will show that uh, abnormal gathering of the abnormal vessels. So abnormal tissue is shown with uh, abnormal vessels, like black, black, you know, very dark color. If you see this plane and uh, with narrowband image, it will show the very clear white tissue the nerve is white and the other tissues are a little bit darker. So you can remove all the other tissues. This is acoustic. And also I show that meningioma case. This is a tubercular cell meningioma, small one. And you can see this, we have we are doing this in intermusic approach. And uh, Then you can see uh, when you see the narrowband image, you see that all the tumor invading dura. Then you can clean up all the things. And also for the in, you know, optic canal, we can use that uh, um, um, uh, the endoscope. And so at the same time, it's a uh, combining and so I should actually relate the combining endoscope with this system is very easy. And so. And I'll show the ICG, this is the vascular case. And as, as we show in the Moya Moya case, it's very bright. And the, it will show that almost all the brain tissues and the other, and the very small vessels, it can be visualized with this ICG system. This is a normal uh, STMC anastomosis for Moya Moya disease. And uh, it's very uh, thin vessel, as you know. And so you, all the tissues can be seen clearly with this system. And uh, uh, it's very easy for shadow and the deep surgery is very easily done with this system. Sorry. And ICG is uh, like this. You can see that uh, 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 middle meningeal artery is also highlighted with this system. It's very hard to see that with uh, uh, pentero navigation, uh, pentero ICG. And carotid endotomy, you can see clearly the all the uh, basa basolums, and uh, also that uh, um, plaque is uh, clearly seen with this ICG system. And then we can do a routine and the part carotid endotomy and, uh, with this system. Again, this is like a macroscopic surgery is easy with this, and it's a kind of macro and the micro surgery is done at the same time with this system. I show one uh, aneurysm case. This is small acom aneurysm, and uh, we do intermusic approach because we thought this might be attached to the carotid artery or optic canal with this image, and the uh, carotid artery is uh, adjacent. Again, this is done under the uh, OBI, and uh, 
macroscopic, the microscopic translation is very smooth. It's an intermissic approach, so bifrontal. And we do, we cut the single side and uh, uh, parks, and then we do bilateral usually. And again, you can see all the meticulous uh, small uh, arachnoid is clearly. Of course, we protect the olfactory nerve. And then uh, you can see that all the perivascular spaces and the flow of CSF. And, um, and then the, you should go, of course, for the uh, uh, intermissic approach, you should go perivascular space first, then uh, you divide along with uh, the space, then uh, dissect the alaconoid. Again, then inch by inch, we protect the olfactory nerve. And with this uh, technique, we, uh, we haven't lose uh, any olfactions so far, but uh, not for that, you know, olfactory group in general, et cetera. But now we start seeing that uh, um, uh, optic, can, optic nerve and also that uh, aneurysm. And all small vessels can be visualized. And then again, uh, as I expected, uh, this aneurysm was attached, this is a, a, a right side A1, and then attached to the internal carotid artery, and also optic nerve. It's uh, sometimes it's very hard to dissect with the perioneal approach with this. It's with the uh, intermissive approach, it's very easy. It's a wide view and also a safe angle to insert all the instruments. We are, uh, I know, basically we always uh, dissect all the walls to make it isolated aneurysm. Then uh, uh, clipping is very mo mo mobile. We can mobilize aneurysms uh, to then check that the left side, maybe. I'm sorry, I went, out, went ahead. I'm sorry. And then turn. Let me show that. Maybe I'll skip this one. All right. And this is a comparison between that uh, Pentero and uh, we don't want to do so much with that. And because I like Pentero too, and then you make Kinebo too, but uh, it's very uh, different. Uh, ICG is uh, dark in the Pentero, but uh, over you can see that all the small vessels and also the, the surface vasculature. But we don't have a flow 800 for OBI system. So we need to develop such thing, you know, to a calculation and the flow system. Of course, now uh, Pentero has a better, you know, yellow light ICG system. And, uh, but uh, uh, so far uh, looks uh, good. And endoscopic, exoscopic combined surgery is very easy. What I'm doing is the uh, end of that uh, internal canal, removing that uh, uh, tumor. And acoustic, because this is a hearing preserved case, and I don't want to injure that the cochlear nerve, so I'm coming and uh, watching it and dissecting the tumor with this. Because I can see in the same view, I can see the all the um, uh, microscopic and also endoscopic view at the same um, monitor. It's very easy to uh, perform uh, endoscopic uh, and uh, exoscopic combined surgery. And uh, we, uh, had, we had a question, questionnaire uh, uh, replied from operators and uh, assistant and uh, resident. And uh, um, operators are almost uh, satisfactory. And, uh, and for the assistant wise, problem was uh, for view vision. It's very hard because he, they need to see from the side. And the 3D uh, view is not as good as uh, operator. Operator is very good. And there's no eye strain for even operators because it's uh, a 4K video monitor. It's very bright. It's not dark like uh, in a usual hybrid and high resolution HD viewers. It's very uh, it's easy to use this. I, I have never. For other 3D monitor, I have a lot of eye strain, but uh, for this 
I did not experience any. Also, we asked a young neurosurgeon and also a student to do practice uh, visceral anastomosis under the regular microscope and uh, under this system. For majority of them, like uh, more than five, you know, seven people, I mean, six people agreed over is better. And uh, only two agreed for microscope, which means, you know, for uh, guys used to do a video game, it's easy to do that, uh, you know, head up surgery, not like uh, us, you know, we are used to do a microscope for a long time, but uh, for uh, young guys, maybe it's easy to do that. Or by need to be improved, we need to sh show the real picture like us, uh, this is show normal case, and uh, and maybe a little bit we need to improve reddish imaging, like where the breathing coming from. And the focus lock uh, function. Sometimes if we move that, uh, this is the automated focus system is if we could, we can switch off, but uh, you know, we should maybe choose uh, accordingly. You know, we don't want to move so much in focus. And hand-eye coordination can be accustomed very well, easily in maybe just, just one surgery, during one surgery you will learn. Time gap between video and the real world is a little bit problem. And uh, for the Dr. Nakatomi, who also used this one, he had, he said uh, it's 0 0.4 second is a little bit problem for him, but I'm not a real quick surgeon, so it's easy for me to do, to do this under this. And we need to do a link navigation system. Now we are trying to develop this is the endoscopic and endoarm system. This is trans navigation system, trans visible navigation system developed by Dr. Watanabe, which is my colleague. And uh, this is incorporated with the endoscope, but now we're trying to incorporate this equipment, you know, this uh, navigation system to uh, this overhead system. So it will be better overhead this way. This is optic nerve is shown with this. This is a mini JAMA case, trans -native. And uh, also maybe we should develop further specific imaging system. As a summary, exoscope can replace microscope in majority of the cases, but still we, you need to improve a little bit nature of the tissue, tissue texture imaging. And the digital imaging is enhancement and sharpness and other uh, uh, specific imaging is very useful. And uh, there's a very wide space in front of you, not like a big camera, big uh, microscopic uh, bodies in, in front of you. It's very free, it looks like very, it's very lightweight surgery. And the uh, surgeon can perform surgery in natural position, like a uh, posterior post surgery, you need not, uh, you don't have to skew like this. You don't have to be, you know, an, uh, uh, sitting in a very awkward position. And uh, easy to adjust hand-eye coordination and the time gap is very easy for me to adjust. And, but uh, we need a better image to show the tissue. Uh, so this system, this system may innovate microsurgery in near future. Maybe majority of the young people might start using this. That's all, thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Akio. Very nice videos and a very, very clear presentation. Um, I have a quick question for you. Do you find that the depth of the, f the depth of field and the width of the field gives you more information than you need? You know, those of us, you and I, who've grown up with microscope, you can focus on an area, and because you don't need to do surgery on multiple areas at the same time, does it? Do you find that working through the orbi, your attention gets diffused? in the space uh, that you're looking at or no? Of course, you know, you can see all that, you know, surrounding people too, in, your own, in right. the surrounding that uh, and, uh, monitor. But uh, uh, for me, when you concentrate in that, uh, you know, for that uh, monitor, it's a very similar feeling. Mm. Yeah. yeah so that, do we have time? To... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if we have time for one question. Dr. Morita, thank you for an amazing talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and uh, I would love to now, I'm compelled now to try this technology. Um, let me ask you, so one of the most compelling, I love the mouthpiece as many of us do uh, in the microscope and being able to fly with the scope in and out. And one of the most compelling, compelling situations is let's say a deep AVM feeder or clipping an aneurysm 
when you're having the scope follow the clip as you're working behind the basilar or can you do the same can you follow get that same feel of following as your as your as your clip is advancing across the neck so you can you can stay focused along the the entire uh because it's a moving target so to quote unquote right. so can you do the same with the orba yeah but i don't use the mouthpiece <laughs> okay okay uh, is, fair uh, enough yeah, yeah, yeah fair you. Fair, yeah. fair enough. If fair you enough. want to move your view with you along your, you know, creeping, maybe better with the microscope. Got it. Okay. But, that may but, be it. Yeah. But Akio, my, my understanding is that the depth of the focus depth is, is bigger than the microscope. So you, yeah. right, you, so know, may... you do not need to change the position, correct? I mean, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. That's like, the, what's the uh, changing position with the microscope? Like Joshua said, it's very hard to manipulating that uh, because a uh, microscope he moved more microscope more often but with this over it's very light actually it's very to move maybe better than microscope it you need that mm, you know. interesting thank you and i'm certainly not surprised the younger people prefer it because that's what right. they've grown up you know as you said video game and so forth and not used to those of us who are tethered to our microscopes Okay, excellent. Accio, so again, feel free to leave us any any yes. time you want. Uh, and that's why we're asking questions. Question. See you Thank soon you. at another webinar or something yes. soon. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Walter, go ahead. All right. I am going to share my screen. Um, the whole scene of Washington, D.C. behind you. Yes, uh, I took that picture about five years ago or so, um, and uh, it happens to be in the fall and seems to be appropriate. Uh, we're given the debate today as well. Uh, thank you, Jacques, for inviting me to do this. It's a great honor. Uh, there's been a lot of references about my age uh, in this last hour. I have to tell you that I'm actually 105 years old, so don't, don't think that I'm that young. Um, it's an honor also to be talking at the University of Miami uh, about augmented reality since uh, University of Miami is at the forefront of this technology. Uh, I have to tell everybody that Mike Ivan is doing great work in this uh, with LeapFrog, and um, I'm looking forward to a lot of the publications uh, coming our way. So a, a, lot, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to sound a little bit familiar uh, from Josh's talk earlier, but I'm going to take you through a, uh, um, a personal odyssey um, so that it's more like a story of how this uh, technology uh, started maturing in my own practice. Uh, when we were gifted this technology, when GW acquired the technology about three and a half, four years ago, uh, we were told that this is great for patient engagement. And indeed it is, uh, you know, people, the patients can now finally understand what an AVM is because they can fly around their own AVM and look at the anatomy, feeders, trainers, and so on. And I say, aha, there's an aha moment for them. Uh, and now there's scientific evidence that in fact the consent process with patients is actually improved with uh, VR. Uh, and indeed, that, of course, gets all the headlines. WebND wants a piece of it. News channels wants a piece of it. And indeed, that's how it all started. And it's very, very useful for that. But then we started getting uh, to, to smarter and starting to use it uh, more uh, with more savvy. The next part, of course, comes at surgical planning. And initially, this was, again, uh, very uh, rudimentary, shall we say. Uh, it involved touring the anatomy, looking at the uh, feeders and drainers and uh, uh, learning it from VR. And indeed, it is very valuable doing that way because it's three-dimensional. And it happens to segregate the onyx really well from the uh, live AVM. And so we are beginning to use uh, it outside of patient engagement for our own benefits, for our own surgical benefits. And uh, surgery, certainly uh, rehearse, uh, planning was the first step. Well, if that is the first step. And the next logical thing is, well, instead of just touring the anatomy, why not interact with the anatomy? So next concept is surgical rehearsal. And this leads to uh, some uh, fun projects. Uh, this one, in, for example, is a pineal tumor. Uh, and it happens to be uh, complex in the way that m multiple approaches can get there. So let's play around with it. Why don't we play around with VR and see how the trans, uh, uh, colossal uh, approach would work. Well, it wouldn't work very well because the corpus callosum is actually completely blocking uh, the tumor as well as uh, the veins. So you can uh, use the same model, a sp patient-specific model, uh, and do a supracerebellar variant, uh, as in uh, 
option and you find that, okay, that gets the tumor just fine. The precerebellar vein is right there. But uh, the angle of the 10, you can see that my neck is really looking up and that could be a problem. So let's practice now the paramedian approach for the exact same tumor. And the angle is uh, less steep with the tentorium. The cerebellar vein is out of my way and the approach and opening is just uh, fine. So uh, this uh, little rehearsal showed us that in fact, the paramedian approach may be very, very appropriate, much easier to do than the other ones. And indeed we've executed that plan with this particular one. And then our use of this technology gets a little bit more sophisticated step by step, uh, starting to get more and more advanced. If you can rehearse the, the uh, operation and then you, that, you can couple that with navigation, suddenly you have another uh, aspect that opens up for you. Uh, give you an example, a far lateral juxtacondylar approach for hemangioblastoma near the brain stem. So we're practicing this approach. How much bone do I really need to open up? Jacques and I have debates about uh, far enough lateral or not far enough lateral. How much condyle do we drill out? So, well, you can practice it. You can practice this as many times as you want to get the absolute perfect opening such that you don't destabilize the joint, but you have enough access to the tumor. Then it dawned on me that, hey, why can't I use this, the thing that I just did in the office as a template to navigate with in the operating room? And in fact, we did. So we bring the template as a savable file into the operating room and navigate off the template. Now, this is a somewhat new idea, a new concept now. You're not navigating anymore to find something. You're not navigating to use it as a compass to find a bearing. You are now using navigation to duplicate something that you practice in the office. You're duplicating a template. So that is a somewhat new idea. Uh, and uh, let's use that with AR now. Okay, let's practice the endonasal approach for this tuberculum settlement in geoma. Posterior septotomy, sphenoidectomy, drilling the tuberculum. How much of this do we need to drill? Well, we certainly don't need to drill any further than that because we have a wide view of the tumor right there and we don't need to open the optic uh, foramen on either side or do anything more. Okay, well, if that can be saved as a file, integrate it with your navigation, then you can bring into the OR as a navigable template. And that's what we did. So here's opening in real, real life. There you have AR and the VR. Let's superimpose those two. Okay, maybe just a little bit more opening on the patient right. And that is the duplication of the template from the office. And so you would have a perfect opening to get this meningioma out without any more problems. Now, so then that led us to write about this concept about navigating from a uh, integrated template from VR to AR. That brings us, just brings me to the next concept that I want to talk about at, at some length. It's a Goldilocks principle of minimally invasive surgery, minimally invasive scalp based surgery. This is the holy grail in many ways for minimally invasive scalp based surgery. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. You don't want an opening that's too big because then it's no longer minimally invasive. But you also don't want an opening that's too small because that could be dangerous. It could uh, not have, there's not enough exposure. You end up being uh, uh, overly small and restrict yourself and you may hurt the patient at the end. So the Goldilocks principle, not too big, not too small, just right. And it applies to multiple layers of uh, this scalpel surgery. And I call it the three S's as I talk to each our residents, safety, specificity, and, uh, and safety. So not too big, not too small, obviously refers to the size, specificity, location, not too anterior, not too posterior, not too superior, not too inferior, just right. And then the safety comes along with having enough of an opening to be safe and not getting into trouble, uh, hitting something on the backside or hitting something that's invisible. Uh, this is then the Goldilocks principle. I want to show this principle in a case of a microvascular decompression. Now, we're going to talk about the size and specificity with AR and navigation. A microvascular decompression, as you all know, can be done in a very, very small hole if that hole is placed perfectly. And that perfect location is, of course, the junction of the transverse and sigmoid sinus. Now, can you find that all the time on 2D navigation when you're using a wand and having to look at the screen? I put to you that it's somewhat difficult to do that uh, with 2D navigation. 
well, why don't we use a template and see whether we can do this better? Let's see whether we can use a template and do this better. So what we do is then we see the nerve and we look at the nerve from the inside of the skull and we're drilling inside out. We're drilling a burr hole from the inside of the skull out in the perfect location where the transverse sigmoid sinus is. Now, then we can mark that as with, with, a, with a dot and drill the hole that we need in practice in VR. And we map out that in AR projected on the patient's skin. This is in the operating room with patient anesthetized position. That dot is what I put in the office as my uh, templated burr hole opening. And my burr hole is uh, brought in as a navigate, navigatable template and projected onto the patient as an AR object. Now I'm mapping that burr hole that I did in the office onto the patient in real life, and I'm simply duplicating my template now, okay? So I projected that template as an AR object projected on the patient, and that led me to the perfect opening at the transverse sigmoid sinus. It's perfect not because I'm some genius, but because the technology allowed me to do that. And voila, 13 millimeters, and I've got plenty of space to do this with absolutely no doubt that I'm in the right place and the size can be perfect. So the Goldilocks principle here, size and specificity of location allows you to do the job adequately with minimally invasive technique. Um, again, a navigable template that you duplicate and the concept also working inside out. You're drilling from the inside, seeing the transverse sigmoid sinus junction and drilling it out to be in a perfect position. Uh, here's another uh, demonstration of the same principle, size and specificity. Uh, using a clinoid meningioma as an example. Uh, this can be taken out through a very small opening, mini-terional craniotomy. Again, if the placement of that opening is absolutely perfect for the exit of that tumor. So again, the concept of operating inside out. Uh, here it is. Uh, there is a tumor that's crushing the nerve, a uh, patient having a little bit of symptoms of optic nerve uh, impingement. Here's the, uh, just the touring of the anatomy, just like we, we used to do uh, when we first got the technology. And now we're gonna rehearse. We're gonna rehearse several uh, approaches, just like that pineal case. How about a superorbital uh, approach uh, through an eyebrow? Tiny little superorbital opening, incorporate the orbital rim. Uh, boom, it's gone. Let's drill down the clinoid. And it turns out that this is a very, very nice opening for this uh, tumor, for this patient. Uh, but there's one problem. The problem is that she has almost no eyebrow. Her eyebrow is extremely thin, and I didn't want to uh, scar her. So here's the mini terional. Now, see what we're doing here. We're drilling again inside out. For the perfect placement of the mini terional opening, that burr hole has to be absolutely at the floor of the anterior fossa, right at the wing of the sphenoid. And if you can do that, then you will have an absolutely perfect opening. So we're drilling inside out, right at the tip of the sphenoid wing. We're going to fly out of the skull put a marker there so that we can navigate with this, okay? That's gonna be part of our template. We now drill the three by three, classic mini terional opening, sphenoid wing, anterior clinoidectomy, the rest of it is uh, not very exciting. Uh, and then we're duplicating a template after the clinoid is, is taken off extradurally. And we see that we have a equivalent exposure to this uh, tumor through this opening. All right, so let's do it in real life. Uh, patient is now anesthetized in the operating room, and we're going to project that template onto the anesthetized patient, navigate it uh, through a microscope. You see that dot right there? That was a dot that we previously placed in rehearsal in VR. That's going to be where I'm going to make my uh, burr hole. We're going to map uh, the opening, the military opening, as an AR projected object, and I'm designing the incision backwards from the opening that I just marked to design the incision. Now, intraoperatively, we are duplicating the opening three by three mini terional craniotomy uh, that we practiced in the office. And we're making sure that it's in the exact same location as we did in the office. And now and then we can bring it in. For the anterior clinoidectomy, this is actually also very helpful because you, can, you know that you have to drill the roof of the orbit, uh, roof of the uh, optic foramen. And if you can project that optic nerve in there, you know where the roof of the optic foramen is without any doubt. So you're peeling of the meningeal orbital band uh, as the drilling proceeds closer and closer to the uh, optic foramen. Peeling, peeling, peeling. 
And you can see the ACP right next to my dissector there. And as we go towards the optic frame and to unroof it. And not to belabor the point, there's your ACP. We eventually unroof it. And there you have it. We unroof this and then uh, drilling the optic strut. And then again, just to save time, we'll move forward. There's the anterior incline coming out extradurally, inject the powder, and then you open the dura. And again, uh, the rest is very straightforward. There's the tumor, there's the ipsilateral optic nerve. Attack the base first, take, get rid of the blood supply. And um, tumor comes out and everybody lives happily ever after. Uh, you, of course, uh, that gives us the uh, opportunity to take out the dura of the anterior cliner where the tumor started from the get-go. Uh, that gives you a modified Simpson 1, if you will, a skull-based version of Simpson 1. Uh, and just to show you that the opening is as we designed, uh, before we close, we put a ruler in there and there's a three centimeter opening, classic mini terional. Uh, so again, what assisted this process was the concept of drilling inside out at the wing of the sphenoid, at uh, the wing of the sphen uh, wing of the sphenoid, and uh, placing the mini terional craniotomy exactly where it needs to be for the exit of the tumor to go smoothly. And you can see the incision uh, is barely two inches. Uh, how about safety? If we talked about the specificity and size of this uh, using AR, uh, what about safety? Uh, anterior petrosectomy. Things that you can hurt with that, well, there are lots of them. I have personally hurt the cochlea because all these structures are buried deep in the middle, floor of the middle fossa that you're not going to see until you actually get hurt them. The labyrinth, the cochlea, the seventh, eighth nerve complex behind where you're going to drill, and of course, the, the laterally, the ICA. So now, if you can segregate all this and bring them in as navigable uh, augmented reality objects into your field, then you might have an actual safer drilling of the Kawasi area. Here's a tentorial meningioma we decided to do an anterior petrosectomy for. Uh, first, we let's practice it, rehearse it in VR. Uh, the dot on the, the yellow dot is uh, ovale. We're gonna put another dot at the lateral edge of the uh, Mecco's cave. And in between the, the green dot and the yellow wall, which I printed out as the plane of the IAC, is my drilling area. There's Colossus quadrilateral. And I'm not going to hurt uh, those, the cochlea, the labyrinth, and the seventh day nerve complex because I can actually see them in rehearsal and uh, drill, uh, practice the drilling with that. Here's the drilling finished in rehearsal. That leaves plenty of room to get to the tumor. And let's bring all that stuff as navigable objects into the uh, operating room so that we don't hurt them. It's like drilling with x ray vision. So the green dot, the yellow dot, the same as rehearsal, the wall, the IAC, same as rehearsal. You can see the cochlear in light blue, the purple of the uh, internal carotid. You're never, ever, ever, ever gonna drill into this again. When I submitted this video for uh, adjudication, uh, one of the reviewers said, well, I've done 105 anterior putrosectomies. I've never drilled in any of these. Well, if you've done 105 putrosectomies, then you don't need this, obviously. But for people uh, who, who haven't done 105 of these or 200 of these, perhaps they may be useful. Here's the tumor, uh, cut in the tentorium, tumor comes out, everybody lives happily ever after. Um, I'm beginning to sound like a nursery rhyme. Uh, the final thing I, I will show you is now uh, talking about a middle fossa approach, same thing. Uh, this time, however, instead of drilling away from the no-fly zone that Josh talked about, those objects of cochlear, IAC, and, uh, ICA and whatnot, how about drilling towards a target? Now, as you all know, Bill House invented this uh, concept of the middle fossa approach for vestibular schwannoma in 61. It is not that easy to find the uh, internal acoustic canal, right? That's why you pay a high paying otologist to do that. Uh, the steps are uh, not quite relevant here, but you have to find the GSBN and that will lead you to the canal. Uh, Bill House has his own way, which is to drill the genicular ganglion and follow facial nerve that way. Uh, Fish has another way, which is bisecting angles and finding the accurate eminence, which is somewhat difficult to find sometimes. And then finally, I think the most uh, popular way of finding the IEC is his bisection of the angle uh, that Garcia Urbana says is bisecting the angle of the accurate eminence and the GSPN. And then of course, people said, okay, fine, let's use navigation, dummies, why do we have to do these angles? I don't have protractors in my eyes. 
But the navigation is somewhat difficult because, again, you're trying to find a three-dimensional object, which is the IAC, in a two-dimensional navigation plane. And plus, you have to look away from the uh, operative field to look at your wand and probe and, and, and screen for navigation. Look at this picture of, of, of Superman with the X-ray vision. He's not looking at a screen to see past that wall. He's looking through the wall to see the wall in the same visual field. So again, the whole concept of the heads-up display is very, very important. So what do we do? We're going to put the tumor in as a navigable object, AR object, into our field. And then we're just going to drill right towards the target. Forget about bisecting angles and finding the arcuate eminence and whatnot. If we can actually see the tumor through the floor of the middle fossa without X-ray vision, we can drill right at it. And there should be absolutely no doubt that we're going to arrive at the tumor without any high-paying otologist in tow, theoretically. I love otologists, by the way. Don't write me hate mail. Uh, and uh, there you have it. So what we did here is an experiment. We have a, oh, I, uh, this slide is not supposed to be like that. Let's see. Where, OK. This is an experiment of a painted, this is a 3D printed skull of a patient with an intracranolicular uh, vestibular schwannoma. The schwannoma itself is painted in green as the center part, and the yellow as the dural part. And it's buried in a floor of the middle fossa, just like you would expect. Uh, we have segregated the anatomy of the cochlea and the, and the vestibule and all that as navigable AR objects. And we're going to see whether we can use AR to drill to the target in this printed skull. And so here you are at the beginning of the setup of the, of the experiment. The brainstem and the superior cerebellar artery is aligned to the model. Uh, and then the green is the target of our vestibular schwannoma, the floor of the middle fossa. We're not bisecting any angles, we're drilling right at it. So we, let's start this process. This also uh, avoids the no-fly zones, of course. You're not going to drill towards a, uh, drill at the cochlea or at the labyrinth if you have this as well. And I wouldn't be showing you this if I didn't succeed. And by the way, thank you, Rob Lewis, for these uh, for this particular collaboration uh, with this experiment. And there you have it. The, you can see that the green and the yellow is coming into view. That is exactly where our AR a navigable object predicts our tumor starts, posterior part of it. And then we complete the drilling and you're at the tumor and there you go. So, And this is not stopping. Okay, so, so to conclude, just a couple of conceptual things. Uh, with VR, we can rehearse the procedure before, and that could give us a plan that some options are better than other options for approach. And it creates a template for us to navigate with the Goldilocks opening. So we don't have to make it too big, too small. It's going to be perfect. Uh, the template navigate is navigable in VR and AR uh, in the operating room, and that maximizes the perfect position of the, of, of the, of the opening, it perfect the size of the opening, and maximizes safety. And uh, there is, uh, we are now drilling with X-ray vision like Superman. We know there's no pointer and no head turn, and all these are navigated as three-dimensional uh, objects. So I hope that uh, the the viewer takes away a couple of concepts, which is there is a real advantage of operating inside outwards uh, to put the burr holes drilling at the junction of the transverse sigmoid sinus inside, at the wing of the sphenoid inside out, and then designing the uh, uh, incision after you have the navigated template of the opening projected on the patient. Uh, and then the navigation is now no longer a compass for you. It is really a tool to duplicate whatever you very practice in the office. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, I have a couple of things to say in conclusion, uh, just as a, as a pitch. Uh, there is a whole AR VR uh, issue coming out uh, with uh, neurosurgical focus. Uh, please submit your, your, your uh, manuscripts and also uh, wait for this to, to uh, come out so, so you can read all about uh, how it's applied in the spine and other uh, uh, subspecialties. And here's a plug for uh, Jacques' next appearance with me. Uh, which is on Surgeon's Log next week uh, in an episode that we're calling the Dragon, Dragon Tiger Afraid. So uh, with that, I will end and uh, keep quiet now. 
and uh, please questions. Walter, that's excellent. Very clear, very logical. Uh, um, so you, you really feel though that experience means less utility of this technology or it seems to me that even if you're very experienced, you can still draw significant benefit from a specific patient. You know, we're not, you're not going to learn a new approach with it, but... Jacques, the, the, the experience comment was completely tongue-in-cheek because uh, writing about this stuff, and I'm, I'm sure Mike uh, has experience writing about his AR projects as well, you get you get doubters and say, well, I've done this 100,000 times. I never had this technology, so this technology must be bunk. People said that about navigation when navigation first came out. Like, I, I've done this a thousand times without navigation. Why do you need navigation? So there's no data that says navigation perhaps is perfect. There's no data that, that strongly supports that this is useful. But you know what? It is intuitively useful. Uh, I don't care how much experience you have. I think you learn new things as you apply this uh, technology. And it's good for novice. And it's good at a different layer, at, the, at, the, at a different level for the experts. If you've done a thousand right. of these, this just makes you maybe quicker, maybe faster. Even if it saves you five minutes per patient, that is saving a lot, you know, at the end of the day. So I think uh, it's applicable across the board. Mike, you have a comment? Yeah, Walter, I mean, I just want to say it's an exceptional work. I mean, you know, just the different ways that you, you looked at this, uh, especially with the inside out, doing surgery backwards to really kind of optimize how to use this technology, I think is so key in, in kind of taking it to the next level. I was just interested to see what your workflow is now. Uh, you know, are you are you doing this for every school-based case? Uh, if so, is, you have a team lined up for it. Uh, how do you process that? Do you have now an MRI done? earlier so you could talk in the in the patient's clinic with them about this how does that all look in in your practice right now i think the best example is the mvds uh yes it does involve another layer because i do need the ct scan uh for the bone and, and the bony structures if i'm if i'm if i'm navigating with a tiny little template i need that bone to be perfectly displayed and i need the ct so there's at, and one added study for sure um but I, i'm using it for everything that i can uh, think of as a goldilocks case if I, if I need that opening to be absolutely perfectly placed and therefore and small, uh, I'm doing both the CTA and an MR, and then uh, the, the, the surgical theater staff uh, helps us tremendously and puts it in the navigation system, and bing, bang, boom, it just happens. Uh, and uh, I, I think it really does help. It, it certainly be, made me a minimally invasive skull bridge surgeon, whereas, uh, you know, I, I've always never taught these small holes and keyholes and whatnot. Um, okay, Walter, that was great. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't see any other audience questions. So I think we'll uh, move on to Bernard. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Jacques, for the honor and pleasure and privilege. Uh, three tough acts to follow. Uh, I'll forgive you for that. Uh, wonderful talks by all three speakers. Really enjoyed them. And I, I actually I wrote down a lot of notes and a lot of things to follow up on. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about fluorescence and talk about how we can uh, bring fluorescence, uh, uh, make fluorescence more user friendly with augmented reality. Uh, let me see. I don't know why my slide is not advancing. Let me see here. Okay. So I want to always thank our team. These are the folks I meet with sometimes daily, at least weekly, our medical students, residents, fellows, research fellows, clinical fellows who are really responsible for the vast majority of my success, not to mention my family. Uh, speaking of success, uh, I grew up in, I, I spent a lot of my life in Chicago where the common saying was be like Mike. And growing up in neurosurgery, it was always be like Spetzler, be like Heroes, be like Hunt Bajor, et cetera, be like Dan Barrow. Now the saying is be like Jacques. And uh, so Jacques, thank you for putting on this amazing symposium. Uh, most human evolution or evolution of life in general on Earth occurs due to stresses. The, uh, the meteor gave us mammals, uh, and the COVID, with all its disastrous consequences, gave us the uh, wonderful Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Bay Symposium. Uh, so thank you, Jacques, for your resilience and for bringing this democratizing education, uh, education that used to cost $1,000 to attend a symposium now is available free. So that, that should not be underestimated. And I'll come back to the concept of evolution in a minute here. 
Uh, just want to, uh, I've been very lucky and fortunate to have this amazing lab that I co-direct with Kristen Swanson at, at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we were focused on clinical trials, device innovation, uh, and really want to uh, uh, integrating technology. One of our themes is to do the operation before the operation, very much inspired by Walter Jean and Josh and uh, Dr. Morita. And, you know, we, we uh, were early on doing a lot of 3D modeling and then creating silicone vessels from these things to not only to practice ourselves, but we actually had patients clip their own aneurysms or coil their own aneurysms in a clinic, which was which was phenomenally engaging. Uh, and then we added on, uh, uh, this was the HoloLens. Uh, uh, this is a patient with an AVM uh, right here in clinic where you, patients can walk around their AVM, walk through it, under it, around it, et cetera. Excellent for students, excellent for engagement. Uh, this is a patient who was terrified of surgery for her temporal lobe cavernoma. Uh, was uh, could not score well on the GRE. We finally had her walk through her brain uh, in, in this way, and she consented to surgery. She came off seizure medications and then got a 99th percentile. I couldn't believe it on the GRE. She, and now she's in graduate school uh, achieving her dreams. So sometimes uh, the effect on patients uh, is even bigger than the effects on us. Uh, and our students as well. So all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. And we are always biased by what we see. And sometimes our patients are biased or hurt, I should say, by what we don't see. And um, speaking of seeing, light uh, was critical to the initiation of surgery. This is a hospital in the 18th century where surgery was performed between 10 a.m. and 10, 2 p.m. because that's when the sun could come through the roof, the surgical theater. Typically, these were amputations. Tickets were sold, uh, and uh, that's how these operations were funded. Um, we, we've come a long way. Magnification and illumination are the two pillars of microneurosurgery. Uh, some of our pioneers and our mentors, uh, you know, mentors of our mentors, so to speak, here on this slide. And But uh, despite uh, us perceiving that people like Jacques Morcos and others have evolved to do skull-based uh, neurosurgery and cerebrovascular neurosurgery, in fact, Human vision did not evolve to do microneurosurgery. Uh, we are very limited to 400 to 750 nanometers of vis vision. So uh, tumors did not evolve to match our visual spectrum, nor did uh, aneurysms or AVMs. So we have to keep that in mind. And with modern fluorescence, we can use agents like 5-ALA that uh, has these uh, light parameters, uh, emits at 628, absorbs at 410. So we have to use uh, special cameras, in this particular case, uh, dark, uh, dark light, which uh, requires you to turn off the lights in the room and to use a special light on the microscope, which eliminates, in a way, it's a step backwards because it eliminates white light, which is what we need as humans to see. But there's technology coming to convert this signal to, um, to something that can be visible during, during white light operations. And then ICG has been a game changer since the early 90s in, in uh, open micro neurosurgery. Uh, but you have to take a step backwards. You have to move away from your strength, which is white light, to look at a monitor to see this because it's not visible in the visible human spectrum. It absorbs at 740, and, uh, and, uh, and really you need infrared light to see it. So um, then come along the augmented reality. So the, the companies went to the drawing board and say, how can we keep the surgeon focused on the microneurosurgery in white light, which is our human strength, that's what we see, and then superimpose that data, which is not seen in white light, onto the field, and that's GLOW 800. This happens to be from Leica. I should disclose that I, I did rece receive research funding for uh, a 20 patient project to study GLOW 800, but I do not have any other conflicts on this front. And uh, basically, GLOW 800 takes the ICG data and superimposes it into the field, and I'll show you this, what you're seeing in the field is not uh, being picked up from the field. This is software superimposing that data from ICG onto the uh, surgical field. So this is a 63-year-old female uh, with this frame and magnum and angioma, and we're involved. We're, gonna, we're about to launch a trial. We're one of several centers looking at, at the use of 5-ALA in meningiomas. As you know, 5-ALA in glioma surgeries has been a big story, a big game changer. But can you use it for meningiomas? We know most meningiomas are visible with 5-ALA. Can you use it? And, and, and just like Walter Jean's point about this te technology and a lot of naysayers, when I bring this up to people, they'll say, well, why do you need 5-ALA for meningiomas? We can see meningiomas. We do a very good job. 
But, you know, every, as Michael Ivan would attest, and Dr. I'm sure uh, Jacques and Walter see this, we see a lot of recurrences. Uh, we see a lot of cases that fail traditional therapy. So can we do a better job with microsurgery? Are we missing small pieces on the dura, perhaps? Uh, and, and what about recurrent cases where you have a lot of scar and you're trying to be careful with what's scar and what's meningioma? Perhaps this technology can play a role. That's a hypothesis. We don't have that answered. But I have been using it increasingly with recurrent meningiomas and some tougher meningiomas. This is a frame of magnum meningioma where the uh, tumor turns pink. I don't have the actual video of this, but at the end of the case, there was a piece that was wrapped around the vertebral artery that was the dural band, you know, the dural band where the vertebral artery comes in. I wasn't sure how aggressive to be with it, but it was negative on the 5 ALA which uh, allowed me to not be overly aggressive around the vertebral artery. And here, just the resection at the end looks very nice. But again, decision-making at the end of the case, I think, is where this could play a role. Uh, and this is a post-optional complete resection. And this other patient uh, presented with this very small meningioma, but again, to uh, Walter Jean's point, uh, sometimes when you're being minimally invasive, it's helpful to have better vis visualization tools. We use a transpalpebral approach for these. I've evolved this from an eyebrow approach to transpalpebral, which works very nicely. It's a very mobile incision that we do with plastic surgery. Uh, this is a very simple case, of course, but when you're inspecting that dura, being sure that you didn't leave it, it would be very embarrassing to leave a small piece. Not such a big deal when you're doing a traditional opening where you can see everything very well, but as we get less invasive with some of these cases, the downside is sometimes we may miss things. And so that this having an additional visualization, maybe that's a hypothesis, may be helpful uh, in some of these cases. This is an ACOM aneurysm, not a very difficult case, but I wanna show just uh, for, the, for the students in the audience, how uh, to me, this has been a game changer in terms of how I visualize during microsurgery. Again, this is a very nice case for a, a fenestrated clip. Again, we use 3D modeling to get a better sense of the anatomy. Uh, standard approach for this aneurysm, the terrional approach, and Clipping the aneurysm with a fenestrated clip, jumping the A1, A2 junction, preserving the recurrent artery of Huebner. Uh, not a very difficult case, of course, but with, with ICG, you have to look away from the scope. So you're actually taking a step backwards in the evolution of microsurgery. On the right, you see the fluorescence. So you can keep your instruments in the field. You can keep working. You can manipulate the anatomy with the uh, fluorescence uh, also in sight. So that, I think it's a game changer in terms of how we do microsurgery. Post-op CTA. Uh, this 50-year-old female presented with retroorbital headaches, and ha actually, I just clipped her other uh, contralateral and she, so far we've counted nine aneurysms that I think she may be one of my highest uh, numbers that I've done in my career, nine aneurysms, and uh, on this angiogram, uh, just to illustrate, she has this uh, complica slightly complicated multilobulated uh, aneurysms at the MC bifurcation. She also has a hypophyseal aneurysm and contralateral MC aneurysms as well, uh, and she has a family history of rupture. And here it is with 3D modeling. To get a, and now with surgical theater, as Walter showed, we can we can kind of rotate underneath. And really for a, a less experienced surgeon, this is a nice way to look at the anatomy. So you're mentally prepared before. Going back to Jacques, I should mention that I often call Jacques now, I bother him on the weekends to go through difficult cases. And probably the cheapest form of simulation is me calling Jacques and we both mentally imagine the case. I show him the 2D images. But now with this technology, perhaps we can both put on the same Oculus and, and go through the case together in 3D. So the, the, another angle on simulation, which we, not, uh, we haven't touched upon today, but the, the issue of collaboration and, and a tumor board or collaborating with colleagues across the country. Or if I call Walter, uh, he and I can do a case together on, on the surgical theater platform, perhaps. And that, that's another. So here it is at surgery, just to show the fluorescence. Where I'm clipping the first aneurysm that projects towards the frontal lobe. I purposely use this bayonetic clip to keep it away from the rest of the field. So it stays out of my way. That, and then I check with the result with, uh, with the fluorescence. Again, not having to look away. And I think that that's an advantage. Clipping this second aneurysm that's below the complex. Now there's this multi-lobulated aneurysm on top. And I put a temporary clip on M1 because the aneurysm looked ugly. And there's a vessel I want to preserve in the distance there. And uh, just to confirm everything looks OK. It's a very crowded field now. Again, looking away on a monitor would not be as good as looking in the field and looking and getting a good feel for all the vessels filling. I think this offers an advantage uh, in the microsurgical uh, arena. Uh, this is a, a lady with a, this incidentally slightly larger MCA aneurysm. And um, uh, again, these can look simple. Uh, Jacques often says, these look simple on the angiogram, but then when you get in, sometimes they're a little more complicated than you bargained for. And this has a complicated neck. And so you want to look at this with uh, some kind of 3D uh, visualization tool. This happens to be surgical theater. I do not have a conflict of interest with this company. And so in this case, we decided to use a crisscross technique 
where you we, where you gather most of the aneurysm with one clip and then you use a fenestrated clip to create an X essentially. To be in full disclosure, I did this after the surgery. So this is a way to, as they say, you should you should do simulation before, but also not mentioned much today is doing simulation after because we should always study our surgical videos and go back and say, if I had to do it over again, would I do it the same way? Did I really do the best I could? And perhaps show it to friends and colleagues and uh, to keep advancing your skills. And so here it is at surgery, Transylvian approach, as expected, ugly wide neck aneurysm. So I'm putting a temporary clip on the M1, which is a wise idea in these cases, and uh, putting a straight clip to gather most of the dome, but there's a dog ear left. And now I do the fluorescent ICG, uh, but I'm still looking in the field. I'm not looking away at a 2D monitor. I'm still looking in 3D, essentially. And now I'm jumping the first clip with a fenestra clip, so the X technique. And the I'm sorry, I don't have the angiogram, but the post-op angiogram showed a complete occlusion. Uh, I have the CTA here. This next patient is a, has a nice sulcal AVM. Again, uh, this is not a very difficult case, but uh, I want to show how when you're trying to be it's one thing to be sort of macro surgical, but when you're trying to enhance your finesse, when you're trying to make decision about every little tiny vessel, which I think is what it takes to be an excellent microsurgeon, it helps to stay in the field and not look away at a 2D monitor. So here, here it is. This is what I, what I, I like to call a sulcal AVM. And essentially most of the AVM is sitting in a sulcus. And here is its surgery, beautiful surface, and, that, and it kind of d dives into that sulcus. You see here, so you already know a lot of the information. Here's a draining vein uh, heading down, and you see some mixed blood in that draining vein uh, because it's not a very high flow AVM. It's a relatively small AVM. And you can do this without all the fancy technology, but if you wanna be, if you wanna be uh, extra, that extra touch of finesse, I think this fluorescence adds something. And here it is, we've opened the sulcus and we now, we're now studying the anatomy and making sure that I'm making good decisions about every vessel I disconnect. So we can be as precise as possible uh, and comparing the drain, arterialized draining vein to the normal draining vein, normal veins on the surface also without taking my eyes off the 3D structures. And uh, sorry, I, I cut that video short. I apologize. Let me just go back to that. So here we go. And then uh, what I want to show here is during the case, I noticed some I thought I had been disconnected, but there's still some arterial flow into the draining vein. So I went back and found a couple more tiny vessels uh, that were still feeding the, uh, there were still live nidus that I disconnected. And then finally you see it fully disconnected with the arterialized vein normalizing. Again, you could do this with older technology, but this I think adds something nice to our, our toolbox. Uh, this, I, I wanna show this case of, a, this is an interesting, maybe, perhaps maybe provocative idea, but the idea of using GLOW 800 for uh, some cavernomas and maybe hemangioblastomas. For most of these, you don't necessarily need this, but when you're doing, dealing with a brainstem or a hemangioblastoma in the spinal cord or a critical area, sometimes it's nice to be able to be very precise about where you make your opening. Obviously, we have navigation, but in addition to navigation, I'm going to show you how in this case, this is a cerebellar, lateral cerebellar, uh, sorry, hemangioma with uh, a cyst. Again, not a very difficult case, but just to illustrate the point, I want to show, because I think this is, I personally think this is beautiful. It reminds me of uh, Superman's analogy, Walter talking about kryptonite here. But here you can be very precise about where that hemangioblastoma is. And I wonder, I haven't done it yet, but for brainstem cavernomas, I wonder if this could play a nice role in kind of shining the light when, when a cavernoma is just subpeel uh, as to where we should uh, center our incision. Uh, again, didn't absolutely have to have it in this case, but I think it's just for proof of concept. I think it's a nice uh, additional tool on more difficult cases. Uh, this uh, patient is a 41 female with progressive weakness of the upper lower extremity, alcohol abuse. I'm going to end with this case. This is a really nice case we did two weeks ago. And I think uh, Jacques and the rest of all of you are going to enjoy this case for several reasons. One is this patient came to me in, in very bad shape, progressive hemiparesis, lots of seizures, alcohol abuse, some brain atrophy, and this uh, finding, a lot of edema in the hemisphere. And she has this AVM. A lot of white matter changes. Uh, that are very interesting, and I'll show you why in a second. And I was very worried about this patient. You know, she had never hemorrhaged, hemorrhaged to my knowledge, but clearly symptomatic, progressive hemiparesis. Uh, and you'll notice, even though she's very young, a lot of brain atrophy from her severe alcoholism. She has a lovely, lovely parents, and we got her off alcohol. And I decided to recommend to her staged embolization and uh, microsurgery. You'll see here there's a superficial and a, and a uh, lateral draining vein. 
uh, maybe some venous stenosis in that uh, parasagittal vein. And um, I'll show you the angiogram here. Uh, again, this is the significant, this is the tractography and functional. Uh, the motor cortex is one, essentially one gyrus in front of this AVM. And here's the angiogram. Uh, several PCA feeders and a very large ACA, ACA feeders, especially from the contralateral side, which I'll show you here in a second. This is, this is the PCA feeders, two dominant feeders off the PCA, and um, this, you know, carotid, almost carotid sized uh, ACA feeder. So I, I, uh, I, I was worried about her brain. She has all this uh, flare changes, and I was worried about inflow, outflow, mismatch. Uh, what is happening in the surrounding brain? I was worried about resecting this and causing a brain hemorrhage from reperfusion injury. So we decided to go, do a staged, set, spaced several weeks apart, embolization, gently, gentle initially, and I saved this ACA feeder for the day before surgery. Um, and here's, here's a lateral view of that. So first embolization went well. I knocked out one of the PCA feeders, a little bit of the nidus. As you'll notice, there isn't a very big nidus. This is sort of a very wispy nidus. Uh, so there isn't a lot of capacitance in that nida, so to speak. Uh, took out the first ACA feeder, brought her back, took out another, uh, sorry, PC, I meant PCA feeder. And then the day before surgery, there was such high flow through this feeder that I was worried about glue embolization of the vein. So I actually used some coils initially before the glue, before, sorry, the onyx to uh, slow the flow down, which we did. And that worked out nicely uh, and really got it slowed down. And what I want to show you is very interesting. This is after embolization, but before surgery. And I'd be interested in Jack's thoughts on this. The, the flare essentially resolved. And this is one, one of my favorite examples. I, you know, we, we always do staged embolization and say we're going to normalize the perfusion. This is my best example that I can recall in my career for normalizing the tissue around the AVM. I know that's not the main point of this, the theme of the talk today, but I I, I was so excited by this. I wanted to show Jacques and all of you. I think it's a cool example of that. So we took her to surgery the day after the last embolization. And here, going back to the theme of this talk, again, using. And one of my worries with these AVMs is, um, am I st are you still hearing me OK? Sorry about that, is where I put my burr holes. I had one case where I actually put the burr hole uh, drilled into the superficial draining veins. So I'm, I always map out the veins. This is just a simulation because I want the, the burr holes to straddle the draining vein. It turns out in this case, the, the superficial draining vein had eroded the dura. I opened and you could see the vein. The dura had been essentially became like an arachnoid membrane. And uh, so putting a burr hole in that would obviously be a big problem. Again, we can fly through this AVM uh, to start to strategize about the day long 3D challenge of resecting this AVM. And I found as, to the, to, uh, as, as Josh pointed out earlier that navigating on surgical theater is more intuitive, at least to me, than navigating off the stealth, because I can see it in 3D when you're trying to unravel this bowl of spaghetti. Uh, I think it's much easier to put my pointer and look at it on surgical theater. Here is at surgery the, in the GLOW 800, uh, as Hunt taught me and Jacob taught me to open up the arachnoid membranes, get a sense of where the nidus is and start devascularizing the AVM. This, this actually vein in the front, even though it looks dark, it actually had mixed flow, so it was involved. It wasn't obvious to me from the angiogram, but as we the fluorescence showed that to me as we worked and working under that vein and the more dominant uh, inferior and uh, parasagittal veins. So these, these AVMs that have superficial venous drainage are often tethered. So you have to work in these channels around the nidus sequentially. Uh, this, that was the ACA feeder, a little excitement there, but we stopped it with a clip, no problem. And working sequentially, the brain behaved. I was worried about the brain based on that flare changes. The brain behaved very nicely, thankfully. Uh, working essentially devascularizing the circumferentially and going back and forth to fluorescence, uh, navigation, surgical theater. So basically the information from fluorescence and surgical theater, navigation, all integrating there is a deep, uh, using AVM clips on the deep feeders there and um, continue to vascularize. And then, uh, and I, I like to repeat the ICG throughout the case to get a sense of what's happening in the draining system. Uh, and Finally, I felt confident enough that we had devascularized enough to take that inferior vein because at some point you have to mobilize the nidus towards the midline. And so we divide that, that was tolerated. I put a temporary clip on just in case I can still reverse my decision, so to speak. And uh, a couple more feeders in the depth there, no problem there. And then finally taking it off the, uh, uh, dividing that parasagittal vein. She did really well. Uh, she came back to clinic uh, last week and 
uh, this, I, you know, I have to say, it, ten years ago, uh, uh, I was very somewhat nervous about this evening because of those flare changes. But I can tell you that I know it's a subjective statement. Again, to Dr. Jean's point that we don't have data on it, but all that technology really helped made me more comfortable, and uh, really puts you a little bit more in control of as you get more data, you can make hopefully wise decisions during the AVM resection. Post Andrew uh, looked really good, and she did. She did remarkably well. Uh, so final final point I'll make, that was the last case, but we're also bringing augmented reality into simulation. We, we developed this very cheap uh, simulator of aneurysm rupture and carotid injury during endoscopic procedures. And so here we can rupture the aneurysm and we can see that rupture with fluorescence. So we can superimpose that. And um, here uh, where we're gonna rupture the aneurysm, you can see the fluorescence in the simulator. This is a $90 simulator. All the, most of the stuff came from Home Depot to build this. <laughs> it, was, it was a medical stu student challenge. I said, I want you to build a simulator for under $100. Because I have this idea that simulation should be cheap, portable, and uh, and you have to be able to scale it. We're not going to scale a million dollar simulator. So we didn't have all the clip varieties here, but that was one of our students clipping the and was getting control of the rupture. Didn't look very elegant, but uh, I thought she did a very nice job uh, for an M3 medical student. So uh, on that note, I just want to invite you all to Sedona. We're having our hopefully in person symposium. Next year, if COVID rages on, we may have to switch it and make it virtual, July 28th through uh, 31st. And uh, invite all of you to visit us here in Arizona. Uh, and Jock, thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today. Bernard, that was terrific, really terrific. That AVM case, uh, it is quite an impressive result with EMBO. I must say, it shows you how the blood brain, I mean, the brain barrier has had been disrupted and uh, you just calmed it down. That's what was the time interval between that second MRI and, and your embolization? Yeah, Jacques, that was basically after the, uh, you know, I, I don't normally do this. I don't know what made me think of it, but I, I, I decided to get an MRI right before surgery. I normally don't do that. And so, uh, I, but I, I think I was very nervous about those flare changes. Mm. And I wanted to see where we were, so I, I got it the day before surgery. But we started our first embolization probably six weeks or eight weeks before that MR. And so okay. we did one embolization every three or four weeks. I was trying to be very gentle with her AVM. And uh, early at Northwestern, we, when I first joined the faculty, Hunt wanted it done every two or three days. And, and I convinced him to space it out to every couple of weeks. And we shifted to that protocol. We never regretted it, and, and my my theoretical idea was that if we're going to expect the brain to adapt, maybe weeks is better than days. That was sort of the yeah. uh, idea, but I'm not sure if I, I don't have any proof for that, other than my anecdotal experience. Right, right, right. right. Uh, any questions, Walter, Mike, anybody? I'm just, I was asking, I mean, that was phenomenal uh, information. I love thank how you, thank you, so Michael. many different fluorescing uh, combinations now in, in brain tumor and vascular surgery. I think it's, we're still just scratching the surface of where we're going to be in five, 10 years from now, for sure. For the meningioma work that you're doing, have you been using different doses of 5-ALA or is it basically the same dose uh, that uh, you have for glioma? Uh, 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 same dose, same dose. And I would say nine out of 10 meningiomas will light up. I don't know why the occasional one doesn't light up very well, but the vast majority do light up. And, um, I didn't show it today, but I had a case of a recurrent, like three time recurrent um, meningioma, where it was really nice because when you open it, as you know, in those cases, you've got a lot of scar, it's right by the sagittal sinus, what's tumor, what's scar, how aggressive do you get? And it was really nice because it was like, uh, you know, these balls of 5 ALA in the midst of scar. And it was, does it make a difference? Again, all hypotheses for now. Yeah, I think putting the to this question, you know, the dural tail. There's been plenty of data showing controversies between dural tails and knots and when to take right. and when not. And I think uh, I think there's no right answer because I think sometimes it's important and sometimes it's not. So having this as an right. agent may be really helpful. Nice yeah. Work. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else? Well, uh, Walter and Bernard, you're the only two speakers remaining. So my profuse thanks to both of you, to the audience, to Mike, my co-directors, and uh, this was really terrific. Uh, I, and I think each of you kind of gave a different angle to the topic, and the topic is varied enough that it was extremely useful from each one of you. There was no redundancy at all. And, uh, and I'd like to thank all of you.
until we meet again in this virtual world somewhere. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jacques. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you.